This is Saul Luckman. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Conversations on Saul Luckman Uncensored, sponsored by snoozetoawaken.com, resources for lucidity. For more information about my work, including a lot of cutting-edge free content, check out crowrising.com. I'm also on Telegram, where I'm sharing daily truth bombs at t.me slash Luckman. And I'm absolutely crushing it on Substack at saulluckman.substack.com. I want to let you know I'm in the process of modifying whom and what I entertain on this platform. Specifically, I'll no longer be providing interviews focused on COVID or germ theory. If you're interested in where I'm coming from on this subject that I'm frankly sick of, pun intended, I invite you to check out one of my most hard-hitting Substack articles to date, if I do say so myself, which I'll link to in the show notes. Is the scientific method broken or did it never actually exist in the first place? As you'll see in that article, my focus is shifting towards sharing more information on simulation theory, as I do in another recent Substack exclusive, also linked to, that a lot of people have found fascinating. Trigger alert, there's abundant evidence supporting simulation theory and the Phoenix phenomenon. On a similar wavelength, I also just published a highly informative and empowering ebook only available on Substack, Playing in the Magic, How to Manifest Whatever You Desire in the Simulation. Check out this link in the show notes as well. If you're a researcher, author, influencer, or content creator interested in talking simulation theory and related topics with me on the show, by all means, drop me a line. I'm not a proponent of channeling or the recent reincarnation trap or history denialist psyops, so please keep that in mind. I'm also open to coming on other podcasts as a guest to drill down into what's up in the simulacrum and how we can survive and thrive here. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Dennis Gilmore of the redpilloftruth.com, who has recently gracious enough to let me republish an excellent article on my substack titled An In-Depth Analysis of the Archaics Material simulation theory, Phoenix phenomenon, and much more. Dennis is a mystic and writer who graduated from the University of Alberta with a Bachelor's of Science in Pharmacy. While working on his first book, The Unveiling, he obtained a degree in computer programming before having a career in producing pharmaceutical software used across North America. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you this holiday season? Very good. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. It's very cold down here in Florida. We're not used to this kind of thing. It was actually snowing at the Miami game yesterday. I, I know. Yeah, I heard. You're up a, I heard north, it's north down of the there. border, right? Yeah. Have lots of snow. Yeah, in Canada, we're used to it. That's right. That's right. Um, so you, um, you know, your article is really, really fascinating, and I thought I thought it was a, a very, a very thoughtful kind of wide ranging uh, take on the on the archaics material. And I, I just wanted to uh, just maybe start with a little background as to what got you interested in simulation theory. Um, pr probably the Matrix movie was really back in came out in nineteen ninety nine really got me I, it was my favorite movie of all time and it sort of started a subconscious grinding and thinking about it and a few years later then i started to be more active in, in trying to understand because i have computer programmer and i started thinking those terms of computer programming and reality becoming like a simulation and and then there's a lot of people who've taken that theme and did lots of youtube videos and then it was only recently i came across jason Bashir's work and a lot of it seemed to jive he's got a lot of a Credible, cogent, intelligent things to say, and I just sense a lot of truth intuitively, and in, in what he's uh, uh, what he's saying, and it really, really helped to gel a lot of things for me. 
and sort of reawakened in a deeper way an understanding. That's why I wrote my page that you said was a pretty good summation of my understanding. Yeah, it was sort of a ready-made article. I know that you had it as a page. I kind of just gave it a little title, and and but that's all I I did. It was basically just a, a long, good article. Yeah, and, and similar to Jason, you know, I'm, I'm born in Canada and not super religious. My my, my dad was a, sort of a Joe's Witness offshoot called the Bible Students. He didn't really teach a lot, but being born in Canada, respecting sort of that sort of upbringing, a lot of Canadians have a respect for the Bible and Christianity. So I have sort of a, a vague understanding of that. But in later years, like I've done much more research trying to find answers because in, instinctively think, thinking the answers are in the Bible. But, uh, you know, Jason is, is similar in that he has a background as a born-again, or I think he calls himself a born-again Christian or whatever. He was raised by that and his mom. And even while he was in prison, he respected that for a great degree and, and was trying to find answers there. And then eventually examining so many art, uh, ancient documents, he's changed his whole paradigm. And, and I've come to see a lot of truth in what he's saying myself. Right. So did you go on and listen to uh, watch other movies along this, a similar wavelength? Like I, I like Tron and I also like Tron Legacy. Did you watch the, the follow up to Tron that came out about a decade ago? Well, I remember as a kid watching Tron. So that was interesting. But I don't remember Tron Legacy. If you yeah, it came little. out with Jeff Bridges playing um, the primary role in that and uh, the um, the. Gosh, the special effects, the visuals on that movie are, are quite extraordinary. And it literally shows you the flat simulacrum that everything is being played out on and how it it builds itself as it happens all around these characters. It fascinates. Right. Interesting. So they're uh, they're all sort of individuated organic consciousness within the, the Tron, within yeah, the Tron yeah. world. Yeah, so you have, you know, people who are humans who are in there, but you also have programs and NPCs, and it's it's absolutely fascinating. And then the, the sort of subplot is that you have those beings who are trying to get out into reality, so there's sort of an exodus scenario going on. It's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I highly recommend Tron Legacy. I'm not saying it's the best movie I've ever seen, but it's on this subject. And uh, this wavelength, it's fascinating. So that's interesting. So so like the humans who are in Tron, were their thoughts were generating reality, and then these NPCs were trying to, they're sort of like the Archons trying to get out into other, the other reality? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And it's very, very like I said, it's just very well done and, um, and, and effective. And, um, you know, I've, I've watched it probably two or three times. I, I, there's been talk of uh, a Tron 3, that appeared to that idea appeared to die, and now it's there's people talking about it again. So we'll see if, if they if they reboot the uh, the series here. I hope they do because it was really it, it was left off at a kind of fascinating point. And um, there's also even a kind of theme in there with one of the programs, uh, one of the uh, denizens of the computer generated universe who. Basically, you get a sense that maybe she is receiving her avatar or something like that, and she is very special, and she's coming out of the simulation. And I mean, it's and she actually does. She is the only one of them that makes it out of the simulation, but she has the qualities of almost like a benefactor. So it's very, very interesting. Okay, but she was a program. But she was initially a program, yeah. So that's that that's not the same storyline exactly. But uh, there's enough overlap to make it all kind of interesting. Like I'm, you know, just trying to give you this this tiny little uh, nugget of of uh, without giving away too much of the plot because I I don't want to be a spoiler. Well, I can I'll probably check it out. John Legacy, you say? Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's one of the things I sort. Go ahead. No, no, go go for it. I was just going to say, I've sometimes pondered that, that, you know, maybe we start out our existence as a computer program and, and, and through sometimes, you know, creator God, the, I think Jason calls it the oversoul, interferes sometimes in your reality, in your thoughts and can sort of nudge you or even quite forcefully nudge you into a certain direction and the creation of your personality. But there are times when controls are taken off and you, you're like an artificial intelligence with some free will and other times not. It's all as a, as a way to guarantee your ultimate uh, development of your immortal spirit to live forever beyond this reality, right? 
So, so you're seeing a possibility where souls might actually debut as part of a construct and, right. and, and evolve through, through a certain series of lifetimes, life sins, different simulations, that kind of thing. Yeah, even Jason talks about that. You might have started off your life as an animal of some sort, a wolf, a tree or something, and you, and you go through various life sins, not all of them necessarily human, but that some of that becomes part of your subconscious self, and then you eventually do get to human, have a series of reincarnations as human, and then when you've developed that immortal personality, you do leave. Now, he says in 2178, when the whole holography collapses, that's when all the elect or the errants get to leave. I'm not, I'm not entirely certain. I, I think it might be possible you can leave even before that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that is something I, I'd like to talk about in a minute because it's fascinating and I've been thinking about it a lot recently. But before we do, I wanted to go back to a previous point. You just downloaded a bunch of really good stuff, uh, pun intended. So do you think that perhaps this kind of latent consciousness that exists in these uh, proto proto people, if you want to put it that way, uh, or proto errants, that this latent con consciousness that might exist in trees or the natural surroundings helps explain what a lot of native peoples are talking about when they talk about how everything is conscious. They they receive messages from the natural world. They have spirit animals, that kind of thing. Does, does any of that resonate with you? Yes, some of it does. I just got finished reading a book by uh, John Lamb Lash called Not in His Image. Do you know about this fellow? Oh, yeah. I just wrote a, a novel uh, a couple years ago that is a fictional retelling of the fallen goddess scenario. Right. Callie the Destroyer, and it's in, and I cite him in my acknowledgments. Yeah, that's what, let me write that down. What's the name of your book? I might like to read that. Callie the Destroyer. Callie the Destroyer, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it sort of like on a Lash's take on things, but in fictional form. Yeah, it's a it's a futuristic dystopian, but that also mirrors a lot of what's been going on in the last couple of years with the you know the the whole V scenario and lockdowns and whatnot. So it was sort of um, I received a download for the novel before all of that started happening, and it happened as I was writing it. It was a very meta experience. It was like, oh gosh, am I actually creating all of this stuff? You know, sometimes I thought that too. Yeah, reality sort really, of really weird. To shift. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, I mean, obviously he's deep into shamanism, and uh, but he's also very anti sim anti simulation, right? Um, so, so he's a he's a complex fellow for sure. Yeah, I, th I used to be a computer programmer, so I tend to think more in those kind of left brain simulation, break it down to particles, quantum mechanics, and, and this kind of stuff. But he's more mystical shamanism, really. That's what I got from the book. I like the whole sort of idea of there's the originator, Thalate, Sophia, she falls, and she creates the archons by yep. by her fall, which are sort of like the devil and the demiurge, Yahweh. And then the, she falls into the earth, becomes the earth, and creates all life, right? Even Jeremiah 22 and 2229 says, Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. So even within the Bible, which is more by background, there's this idea that earth is alive and it can actually hear. It's like a consciousness that can hear you. Yeah. So back to this idea that the, the environment is a living consciousness. I think there's some truth to that. Even uh, the idea of panpsychism, there's a bit of consciousness in all particular, all, all atoms, molecules. If we're in a living, construct of some sort if you call it Gaia Sophia as the fallen goddess scenario goes or just whatever the originator or god what uh, creator god whatever term you use I think there is obviously intelligence because I've had various synchronicities and things reflected back to me like Jason talks about the simulacrum will reflect back to you as circumstances in life and uh something magical about that stuff that's too coincidental synchronicities they call it the things that are too yeah. coincidental that can be explained any other way Oh, I, I very much agree. I've been, you know, thinking for a little while about the notion of rather than being a kind of physical divine mother, because if you're talking simulation, that 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 really is problematic because we're dealing with ones and zeros in essence. So the idea of some kind of essential female mother, great mother, earth mother, the goddess, that kind of thing becomes problematic from this perspective but i've been playing around with the idea that that really we're talking about a motherboard that is a kind right. of substrate that's giving rise to 
it's, it's basically creating a platform for phenomena. Interesting. So you would say even the Gaia, Sophia, or, or, or Similicrum, whatever you want to call it, is not sort of like an artificial intelligence, not quite alive yet? Or an intelligent of a or sort? An aspect of the programming. Right. So that so that we live in a we live in a, in a program it's a story it has a, a history and it, it goes beyond even the parameters of known history potentially or at least that's intimated by the the uh, concepts that show or studies that show that you know certain phenomena extend very far into the past beyond any kind of recorded history but do they or is that just narrative is it just, just right. a story so in that's back story yeah yeah. So, so or background, backstory, all of that. So, in this way of looking at things, you can't really have a goddess. You can't really have, you know, anything uh, essential uh, that's based in the program. What you have is the story of the fallen goddess. I mean, he literally calls calls it Lash does the fallen goddess scenario, right? And the scenario is a word that derives from the stage. It's a it's a play. There's nothing. Right nothing there really i don't know that he didn't intend it that way but that's a kind of felicitous uh uh you know uh moment in in his presentation i thought it was interesting because you know it sort of jives with traditional religion christianity how sophia fell and created the archons by accident but and that's sort of like the battle between good and evil angels and demons happened before humans even came came along if you jive in the bible there was the devil right there right away to tempt eve and adam and eve right so that it jives with that sort of traditional idea. And I thought what was interesting in Lamb's book is he talks about uh, evil is just your inability to detect error and correct it. Because Sophia, you have, in order to co-evolve with her, the living earth, you have to be able, willing to check your own psyche, see where you're making mistakes and correct them. And that's just, we learn by mistakes, right? But when you don't detect that and you don't learn from your mistakes and you keep doing them, even worse, that leads to evil. I thought that was a very interesting idea is to explain where evil comes from. And the archons, of course, are the are there to tempt you in that way and deceive you along that line. Yeah, that is a really good perspective. I mean, that's quite compelling. I my, you know, I really owe a great debt of gratitude to to Lash. I mean, that I think that book is should be required reading, you know, for for people who are on this this kind of type of errant's path, not in his image. It is truly a fantastic book. In fact, let me make a note to put that in the show notes because it's just it's a really important book um having said yeah, that i thought he had some very interesting points i don't know if you've ever done the podcast with him but uh he'd be interesting one to talk to he would um i was going to also provide a moment of criticism where i feel like he is extremely dogmatic about about his uh interpretation of the goddess and that's why he doesn't like the simulation because it goes against some of his psychedelic experiences and that kind of thing right uh, so and basically everybody else is wrong when he's right, you know. So, <laughs> you know, and you know, he and if he and uh, uh, Jason Brashears ever got locked in a room together, it would be like you know a headbutting contest because there just there there would be no compromise from those from those perspectives. So I don't really. I hear some truth in both of them, though. I wish they would yeah. get together. I sent an yeah. email to Jason and I gave him the book, not in a PDF form, not in his image, and I said, "I hear truth in both. Of you. I wish you could work together." <laughs> Yeah, it, it, well, you know, I, I guess that's what some of us errants out here are doing is we're trying to assimilate a lot of uh, these seemingly divergent perspectives. And, and one of the really big ones is this idea of the goddess Mother Earth and the Gnos that Gnostic, that, that, that type of Gnosticism or that aspect of Gnosticism with what Jason is saying. It's very hard to put the two together. I've had conversations with other people, even some of Jason's moderators who are themselves trying, or at least one, uh, one conversation with a moderator that, you know, there, there are these, there, there are those of us out there who are really trying to see how all this overlaps. And so I, I get it honest. I wrote a book about this before I even encountered Jason's work. And then I began kind of unpacking a lot of ideas as I you know, have gone through Jason's just, you know, kind of encyclopedic uh, database. It's it's very hard to even get through. It's, there's so much. Yeah. I used to be of a mindset that the spiritual truth is only in the Bible because I was born in Canada, kind of influenced by that subconsciously by my parents and whatnot. But Jason, you know, I think Jason probably started a life similar, but in his time examining all these other ancient records and the Mother Shipton, Shipton and, all, and Nostradamus and all these other 
and saying basically the same thing every 138 years the phoenix comes somewhere in the world and all that end times theology that's sort of in the bible too in revelation the destructions and whatnot and the cataclysm he's put it all together as you know the the bible was sort of a summary of that taken in when the jews were in babylon captivity and put together the old testament as sort of a fraud but not really because they're recording things that did were another ancient text of other people having a similar sort of synchronicities and paranormal experiences and they wrote stuff down and the Jews just sort of co-opted it and put their own spin on it. I thought that was a very interesting thing he figured out. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's such an, uh, an amazing bit of uh, academic detective work to figure it out. I think that he's laid out the basic story of what occurred uh, historically there. So that's enormously helpful. If he had done nothing else, that in, in and of itself is just an extraordinary gift to all of us seekers. For sure, he said some Acadian prince named Sargon was was born as a baby in in the river and rescued by and, and that's the whole story of Moses that the Jews took when they were in the Babylon in captivity in the Alexandria Library. So you know it's very interesting. So Moses kind of did live, but not really. <laughs> right, right. It kept all these like these recasting these these repurposing of the older stories. This is this is a common repetitive thread you have the same thing with the crucified carnalized savior figure this is straight out of mithraism it goes way right. well before the gospels uh you know, any of that stuff um basically all of that material uh i think it's matthew mark and john but maybe not luke or it's it, luke or john is the odd man out here but three of those basically are just retellings of older mithraic uh myths yeah i think horus or whatever was the god who had 12 disciples and then died on a tree and then rose from the dead and did miracles and all that it's uh it's, it's there in other ancient documents and and that's like you're saying it's a uh, jewish it's putting into the bible is with their own sort of spin or retelling of the story in a different way and that kind of rattles christians because they think all that magical stuff in the bible happened literally rather than it's it's got a sort of a metaphorical symbolical and allegory truth to it but not necessarily literal so it doesn't disturb me so much to consider that but a lot of a lot of christians would probably be shocked by that yeah you're right i mean I, I should probably put this link in there too jason actually has a video about this called ancient mystery cults and the son of god vow of silence ancient mystery cults and the son of god and i'm i, I put that on my i put that on my telegram channel maybe somewhere else and my comment was the truth will set you free but first it's gonna hurt yeah, that's the thing, right? So we all face suffering of various sorts in life, physical relationships or, or mental struggles. You live long enough, you're going to you're gonna experience some of that symbolically, the crucifixion, I call it, of your AIX carnal mind, where that dies and you stop thinking so literally and the, and the spiritual man rises from the dead where you start thinking in terms of metaphor and allegory. I, I internalize it that way. That's how I interpret it now rather than literal, right? All I like that. Just, said it was literal right mm -hmm. literal miracles i i don't you know there it's a process i see it as a process so someone rising from the dead their spirit rises from the dead they start thinking symbolically the carnal mind dies they rise from the dead i interpret it that way or seeing supposedly jesus gave instant miracles for sight but it's being able to see truth in nature and in symbols and in movies and in, in the bible you, you can allegorize it that's seeing things or or hearing instant jesus supposedly instantly heal, healed people of dumbness but that's hearing the voice of simulacrum speak to you or gaia sophia that inner knowing that there's a voice within you that's not always necessarily your own thoughts there's an intrusion there but it doesn't have to be it's a good intrusion if you take it the right way right that's hearing spiritual hearing oh that's brilliant i really like all of that that's that's a beautiful perspective yeah, and I've had certain experiences where, you know, I've, I've had a thought coming to my mind, and it seemed like my own thoughts as I entertained it and started to talk with that thought in my mind. Things by synchronicities ended up happening in the so-called real world. So by that, I've been able to figure out that reality is not quite what people think it is. You know, by the same token... It is kind of what you think it is. This is the this is the funny thing about Jason's statement: the world is not what you think. And lots of people love to point this out. Lots of errants, and they say, "Well, the funny thing is, it really is what you think." <laughs> That's the nature of the simulation as a builder protocol. It kind of gives back to you what you're thinking. And on that subject, while I absolutely agree that we can look at many 
uh, recorded miracles from a symbolic or allegorical lens, they can also happen literally, many of them, in a simulated holography. Right. I like to say so in the Matrix, had, anything's I've possible. Had, I've had absolute miracles happen in my life that were totally impossible. I've had I've experienced miracle healing. I've seen it. You know, what do you do with all of the stories of spontaneous remissions of cancer, everything in the world that, you know, it's just very hard to wrap your mind around how this could even be physically possible, even thinking epigenetically or whatever. It's just too large that somebody right. could just be at stage four cancer one day and the next day it's gone. And this has happened more than once. And that's a miracle. And if it can happen one time, and someone can experience it, then other people can perform that quote unquote miracle as well. For sure. If you can establish something is true in one situation, why not? It can be established, it can be true in any situation. Yeah. So meaning, you know, we have this benefactor or this inky figure in in this archaic research and in the the history that that's based on, who might have had some Christ-like abilities. Clearly, he had enormous um, enormous intellect and knowledge base to be able to create the plans for the Great Pyramid as a machine that could reset the simulation, which is just right. mind-blowing, which means this figure actually knew how to manipulate the simulation, which to me is about, you know, one microchip away from actually doing quote-unquote physical miracles. Right. And for him to be able to somehow hide that because as, as jason says the inky figure enoch who, who built the pyramid great pyramid pretended it was a pump station or something and and built it and then in a moment flash flashed uh new programming on the solomilicrum to allow for eventual escape so that would be even more intelligent to be able to fool the aix talk about one thing get people to help you build something but it actually has a different purpose altogether you know you make a great point because that reveals you know, if you're looking at this from a psychological perspective, that reveals such a level of personal mastery to be able to control your thoughts and to really keep a lid on all of that from this super prying intelligence. Right. You'd really have to be in contact mentally with Gaia, Sophia, Similicrum, whatever you want to call it, as a neutral field, as your benefactor. Communicating because I, I speculate that Similicrum can hear your voice, but AIX can't. So, but when in talking with Similicrum, there's a coded conversation going on because AIX is sort of listening, listening in, right? Right, right. There's also these protocols that you know that Jason likes to talk about for kind of making uh, uh, AIX, uh, artificial intelligence X, leave you alone. <laughs> so you wonder if maybe uh, Inky used some of those protocols as well and becoming kind of an errant in a certain way that allowed him to just be left left to his devices, even, even as AIX wasn't totally aware of those devices that was the whole that was the whole stratagem it seems to me is that i'm going to do what i want to do you're going to leave me alone you're going to let me do it you're not going to destroy this pyramid like the tower of babel or something <laughs> and you're going to and you're going to think that it's one thing but it's going to be another thing and i'm going to keep that from your your awareness i mean it's, it's really an amazing kind of uh, psychological chess match for sure he must have had a very strong mind over that uh Enoch Enki character was who built, built the uh, pyramid, as Jason says. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, I was looking at your um, your uh, article that I you know republished, and you got a little bit into um, um, the uh, you know some of the more conspiracy uh, theory elements, where you listed a lot of the family names that we all know and love, the Rockefellers and Rothschilds and that kind of thing. How do you see them fitting into the archaics narrative? Well, my ultimate model of reality is if you down later on the page, I talk about the Truman Show. It's sort of a mixture of the Truman Show with the movie The Matrix. So we're in our own little Truman Show reality where I, I know I'm human and everyone around me is a, an actor. They're human, but they're an actor in his world. He's the only one that was sort of what you would call real. And everything my five senses detect is sort of like the virtual reality helmet. And those that are human, my interactions get filtered by the creator God through 
another, through to the other human in prime reality. They, they're also sitting in prime reality with the VR headset on and some of my communications and approximation, I guess, to them, and then comes back out to me. And that's how I interact with people. Some are total NPCs, just part of the program, and some are human in the sense that my, my uh, approximation of my interactions are communicated to them. So that's sort of how I, you know, I, I don't think about that all the time as I'm talking to people, but they're sort of 50% avatar and 50% human in this sense. Whereas in my reality, I'm, I'm like, I perceive myself to be totally human. If that makes right. sense. And that's back to that conversation we were having about, about uh, the evolution of the avatar or, or, or of the consciousness behind the avatar. Because really, you're you're becoming self more and more self aware is essentially what we're describing, right? So so that's why I, I went on off tangent because you were talking about the Rockefellers and Rothschilds. Right, right. They right. would be as much they would be what I would call the AI, AIX part of my brain because everything my I, my five senses detect is either Smilicum or AIX, and those are very negative like that and just want to be archons and control and kill people and take over the world. That is like they're they're MP not they could be NPCs just part of AIX 100% or they really could be uh, evil humans and they're going through their life sims to, the, to where they eventually learn that that's not the right way to treat people because they'll reincarnate some reality where they're possibly a child who's being ritually sacrificed on some satanic ritual or something. And you know what that feels like and you eventually learn through various life sims. And so if, if they're truly human in the sense that I tried to describe, they'll eventually overcome because Jason talks about that too, which I agree a universal salvation for all those that are truly human, but in what my five senses detect, not necessarily everybody is, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So there could be a mixture as well of NPC types and hybrids or whatever you want to uh, call them. Right, the hybrids would be 50% sort of avatar NPC, 50% human, and then there's just total NPCs. I think Jason estimates 66.66% estimates .66 of everyone you come in contact is an NPC. But I say everybody contact contact with is either 100% NBC or sort of a mixture of NBC and human. And the in the way I tried to describe, you're in your own Truman Show reality, communicating through the avatar to the real human, and then interaction comes back out to you in whatever reality you're in. The only the only way you can know is if you are if you are human, then everything around you is is like the Truman Show acting. And the easy way to know if you're human, if you're if this seems kind of strange to people who are listening. After Christ rose from the dead, he could walk through walls and appear and disappear. So I'm human. I can't walk through walls. I can't appear and disappear. So there is a very simple definition of human. Mm -hmm. But everyone else around, being that they're avatars, they could could do that. But they don't do that because they're required to put on an acting job. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very complex. It's amazing. So, you know, I um, I had a, a, an experience... Years ago, I was I was really sick. I, I had gotten the requisite jabs for travel um, during graduate school, and I ended up getting sick from that and spending, you know, the better part of a decade in a kind of autoimmune illness. And then I was um, I was uh, led through a series of kind of shamanic experiences. I, you know, we're talking sound healing. We're talking kind of shamanism here. I was led to Brazil and had um, a, a kind of uh, visual contact. It was almost like an ET experience, but it was with lights that came across the water uh, and kind of came into me. But I never really perceived it as a contact ET experience. I felt like it was like my higher self. And in subsequent years, you know, since well, the last year or so, after really beginning to, to, not even quite a year, but after beginning to get into Jason's material, I've really thought that, you know, what I was saying in my book, Potentiate Your DNA, years ago, that this was my higher self coming to me, may have been really true from a simulationist perspective, because it appears that we do have some ability, some some ability to interface with the, the part of us that's plugged in outside the simulation. Right. So... And it may even be one of the sources of what we perceive as intuition. We may be actually c communicating with ourselves. I think so. The ultimate ideal would be able to exist inside the matrix and outside the matrix at the same time, where you can maintain that sort of altered state of consciousness where you're hearing your higher self communicate and you're more, more willingly acting like a, an actor in your reality, getting feedback from your higher self instead of a lot of times. I mean, you know, I've had some of those experiences, but I, most of the time, I'm I'm not really consciously 
walking in an altered state of consciousness. Like John Lamb laughs, he says he's pretty much always in that state. So, you know, that would be the ideal. I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, I've had a lot of those experiences. And, you know, I mean, um, people get there in different ways. I mean, certainly, uh, I know that he's done a lot of psychedelics. That's been a, a part of his his path. And um, other people do it different ways. So, yeah, wow, just really, really fascinating. So the next question, uh, you know, where I've been going lately is, I've been wondering if there is such a thing as a material reality. So that if we're talking about the quote unquote reality outside the simulation, how, what would keep that from being just another simulation? If creation is something that is is happening, that there's a uh, Jason had a beautiful comment the other night on one of his interviews or videos. I can't remember what I was watching, but he said that um, creation is not an is not an event. I'm paraphrasing. It's not it's not a, a a thing. It's it's it is an unfolding. It's a it's not an event. It's a happening. So that it's constantly going on. There is no beginning or end to it. It's sort of this thing that's seeking to know itself. And it's if all of this is being created from a kind of mental level through the the through the kind of perfected art of the imagination at that level, how would any of this actually be material? What would material even be? Right. I see them as as the same, as strange as it may sound. This table, I'm, I can. It's full of the same material as my body and the engrams of my brain there's it's atoms and molecules which are just highly compacted energy that's how we get nuclear weapons from they just explode the atom and it releases all the energy so it's highly compacted energy into atoms and molecules in the table and so is my body so is my brain cells and so it's the same and yet i can't talk to the table i have to talk to those manifestations of apparent physical reality that are humans like yourself that i can talk to right but in some way, I can't fully explain or understand. The physical seems often so much more real than the internal world, but they're the same. Everything is in a, is a projection, a holographic projection. Without what my five senses detect is being projected off of because my reality being, if I'm right about that, Truman Show and The Matrix, well, then that's all being projected. And everything my five senses perceives is the macro reflecting the, the micro inward. And so what I see out here outward, I try to, in, in this what's going on in the world, I tried to interpret that as an inward reality. What does that mean to me, inward in symbolic allegorical form, right? Mm, mm. Yeah, I, you know, I guess my question is still, it, could, could there actually be a material reality that would give birth to a simulation? Or is are we always in the process of discovering that we're in a simulation? So that so that the people outside of this who think they're real and they're actually playing these simulation games. They haven't figured out that they're in a simulation and that they're also plugged into someone else or vice versa. In, and so it's almost like Russian dolls and it just goes on and on and on. But it's more it's more fractal than that because it would go in all directions. Yeah, I get. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating to speculate. But until I'm on the other side, <laughs> I, I guess that's one I, I can't fully answer. But well, even then, you can fully answer because you pop into your body, and then maybe you haven't actually figured out how your particular simulation is working, <laughs> or you haven't uncovered the data, you know, that proves, oh God, I'm in another simulation. You know, it's like, you know, it would be we're always awakening, right? You know, I, there's this there's this um, physics that I really like that I used in not the last novel, but the previous novel. It's a novel called Snooze, and it's uh, Dewey Larson's physics. It's reciprocal system of physical theory, and he he hypothesizes a kind of unified field that's made up of a two-linked uh, two linked, uh, kind of like universes or systems, and one is space-time, so we live in space-time, and that then links to time-space, and time-space actually energetically gives rise to space time and then space time turns around and gives rise to time space that that's how you get the unified field so so time space would be like the ether that gives rise to what we perceive as material but i've been getting this vision lately that 
that basically what you get here is what I called a rosary the other day in an interview where you have time, space, space, time, time, space, space, time, time, space, space, time. And so you have these, the, these, these weaving simulated systems, holographic systems that are constantly informing each other and allowing each other to exist, but they're all simulated. Right. Fascinating. I, I, I can only say like, uh, I think at the next level, if you go with the following, with the insights from Lamb and uh, Don Lamb Lash, and, and there's great awareness at the next level that the, the aeons were like sort of like God creatures, so, sort of like angels, and they're aware of the originator as the one who the, who birthed them and brought them into existence. There's greater awareness and communion of that, I would say, and that's how you might know you're at the ultimate level of simulation. Because here, I, I forget that sometimes I go about normal life, I'm not mm. consciously in communion all the time. I would say so. That might, to me, differentiate the one reality from the the final prime reality or base reality. What do you think? Yeah, it's possible. You know, in in Callie the Destroyer, I have a character who is the Sophia character, and I have Felite, her consort, and so they're actually characters. So I I spent you know quite a bit of time trying to be in the psychology of these eons, right, or aeons, as uh, Lash right. pronounces it, and you know. Then I encountered the archaics material, and I started thinking about the nature of, of how, what our relationship would be to our higher selves defined as the people who are outside the simulation, who are, who are basically controlling this experiment or whatever. And right. those people, which would fascinatingly include ourselves, those people are the, would be the eons. Right. So <laughs> we're sort of like we're, we are Sophia, right? We fell into this reality for right, various reasons. Exactly. Learning, and we're going back to be the Aeon we were supposed to be in communion with Thalate instead of acting independently. But possibly just inside another simulation because the nature of the originator is such that even though the, the Aeons are said to kind of communicate with the originator, and I dramatize this uh, in, my, in my book, the the originator is originator is still not known it is still the creation in essence and so right. you know there's no real solid ground as it were to base any definitive i don't know epistemology or ontology on if you know where i'm going with that right i see them as all very similar stories so in my christian upbringing paradigm i could say the originator is what's called in the Bible, Father God, the creator, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. the Thelate could be the male construct. God, that could be like Christ. And then Sophia in the Bible says that Christ has his his bride or his wife is believers. So that could be like Sophia. And before we came here, there was some sort of uh, independent act which created the Archons, the AIX mind. We come here, we overcome that, and we become Christ, Thelate or Christ's bride, with Sophia, and come back in the next life to be that but there'll always be some some mysteriousness about the originator i would say as the true creator god who started all the simulations right because there's confusion in the bible between your what you would call a heavenly father the true creator versus your father the devil the bible it gets confusing in this reality right you got your right and then you, the have, devil. you have then you have references to the gods who are conversing saying that the man is is becoming as one of us <laughs> and so there's all kinds of quote unquote gods in the Bible. Right. Yeah, there's distinction though. Psalm 82 6 says, We are all gods and children of the Most High. Wherever this originator, creator God is, I would say is that's referring to the Most High God. Everyone else of us, aeons, angels, demons, humans, we're all gods because you can think you have sentience, awareness of the sorts, but you're not like Almighty, the originator, creator God. You're just mighty. Like the devil might be mighty, but not Almighty. And, that, and that's where the confusion comes in. Mm. Your father, the devil, the father of lies versus truth and the originator and the true creator. It's it's interesting to, I, I know that uh, this is a work of channeling and I'm not a fan of channeling. Um, so I, you know, I'm living with a little bit of a paradox here, but in the law of one material, which is fascinating, although I think it's compromised, there's a notion that evolution proceeds through different levels of um, development uh, different, um, maybe, you know, different actual types of speciations, or you, you go from being like a rock maybe, and then you become a tree and then you're, 
maybe a, or an animal and then you're a human and then maybe you're more of an angelic form and you just keep evolving until right. you fuse with the what we, we would probably call the originator in this discussion. It's called the one infinite creator in the law of one. But the funny thing is, is that once you do that, you just pop back out the other side and you start going through the whole thing again. So it's like this idea of these repetitive simulations is, is, is kind of it's there. It's always there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's everywhere I look, you know, it's like it doesn't really there's not really an end point to it. There's not a destination. The destination is the journey, if I could just use that little cliche. Right. Yeah. The journey is the destination. Yeah, it's a, a long, uh, infinite long process, perhaps. But I found that interesting. You say we all merge with the originator, the original creator God. So that's as an intermediary, Thalate could be said to be Christ and Sophia or those who think who are errants could be the polygamous wives, I guess I would say, of Christ to <laughs> merge with Thalate, who then emerged with the original as, as just media, an intermediary step to get, ultimately become the polygamous wife of the original creator God. Father God, or whatever you want to call it. Not you got to distinguish so between the devil, though, and the father of lies to get to that level, right? Mm -hmm. And here we're learning how to test things. I, I, in my life, I find ways to try and test things to figure these things out. Right, right. Yeah, me too. I mean, I look at data, I look at patterns. You know, one of the things I, I love about the archaics approach is that it's boiling things down to mathematics and calendrics. Right. It's a powerful way of testing concepts. Exactly. If you can predict the future, like Jason's got a pretty good accuracy rate when he was doing his sports connect predictions, 80, like 90 percent. And then at some point it all broke down because people were becoming too aware or, or convinced he was right. And it seems in one of the videos, Jason mentions that, you know, the simulacrum will create or negate necessarily based on what people believe. So it's almost like to hide this this truth that the, we're in a holography that responds to math. You should be able to make predictions, and Jason does pretty well. But then they start bre breaking down at some point when too many people become aware. What do you think of that? I think that's exactly one of the things that's going on. The other thing that he's also talked about is this fine structure constant, 137 point whatever, that's essentially almost 138. But you have to have a pattern break for the numbers to even be meaningful. Otherwise, it would just be some other number a much larger number that would just keep going, right? So you have to have a pattern break. So the there has to be an actual breakdown in some of these strategies for them to all, to keep rebooting. It's almost like what he was just experiencing from a from a forecasting standpoint was little miniature phoenix phenomena. Right? That were kind of blowing up his model and then it and then it reassembles and it does it again. Interesting. So the phoenix sort of breaks down the holography, you're saying? The phoenix is basically the same number as the fine structure constant. It, cre it creates regular intervals that allows time to be divided into segments so that we right. can have a meaningful mapping of our experience in the simulation. And it does this through a destructive act. And so when he was talking about his predictions going south on a regular basis, which they did like every fifth or sixth uh, or seventh uh, uh, time, there would be a breakdown. And it's right. it pretty darn regular. And it had that same feeling of being like a pattern break, like a fine structure constant that is uh, allowing us to actually define uh, you know, a temporal experience here. Okay. So do you believe it's possible on a more macro scale to break down Jason's predictions about 2040 Phoenix? Yeah, these are, these are fascinating questions. Um, you know, just, I think it was, it was, it was in the last night or two, my partner Lee and I were talking about this and, let me just start by saying that, so I, I would like our listeners to understand the terrain here. Jason has a, a model that there are two realities, that there is a collective experience that is scripted like it's a video game that we're living, right? And then there is the personal experience of interacting with the builder program that is the simulation. And in, in that experience, you can create highly individualized and novel life experiences. So there is some ability that we have 
to script our own existence within the larger script. For him, the larger script is essentially unchanging. The smaller scripts that are our individual lives are highly, highly malleable. And so when you're becoming an errant, you are learning how to really become the, the writer of your own script. So the question is, can we as errants, tell me if I'm wrong, correct me, can we as errants do anything to change the events that Jason is predicting for 2040, 2046 and beyond? Yeah, that's what I've pondered. I mean, in in the smaller microcosm or of your own individuated reality, he did sports predictions and they broke down. And that's a collective. That's a pretty large collective. A lot of people watching millions anyway, watching whatever the sports are. And if that can be changed, why not in a wider collective of the entire world? I, I technically, theoretically, it's possible, but how to how to get the whole world? Because enough people have to become aware and start believing in it before things can be negated, right? And uh, Jason's got something like 70,000 followers, but that's far cry from probably millions needed. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I said something recently in, in one of one of my articles that if we could get all of the energy that's put into sustaining these dominant narratives into waking people up to the fact that they're in a virtual reality that they're living in a simulation then i think we could do what you're saying we that we would end the simulation right then and there i believe right that would do it so i think the my answer to your question and i would love to hear your thoughts is i think theoretically it's possible i don't at this point believe it's going to happen and i also kind of don't care whether it happens because the errant's path is so powerful and fun and meaningful and it might be the, the point of it. But I also have another, there's a third path that I would like to discuss. But before I do that, I would love to hear your thoughts. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a, uh, an incarnation I'm having where it's like, I've heard people say, oh, I don't want to come back and do this again. I've, I've, held, I've experienced enough hell in this hellish world that I'm not interested in coming back. So that's sort of my current, in this incarnation anyway, way of thinking, right? So I think it is possible you can, you don't have to come back. I mean, Christ, after he rose from the dead, apparently could walk through walls and do things. So, and yet he's still within this time space of this, of this six thousand, well, seven thousand years of holography before it collapses in twenty one seventy eight. So, if you don't want to or need to come back, there is a point at which you can escape entirely in this point. And but the errant's path is is very similar in the end. I mean, everyone gets to that point. I think eventually. How about you? Would you would you come back if you could? I'm I'm done. I'm absolutely done. I'm out of here, you know. That's what I'm thinking too. That's how I feel. And I've really felt that way for a long time. Not that I don't enjoy life and that I, I don't uh, have plans and I'm not excited. I'm, all of this is very exciting to me. I just know that um, even though I'm still learning, I've learned the core concept that I came here to learn. And I'm going to refine that and I'm going to, you know, continue to build my character, you know, to work on my virtue, to work on empathy, intuition, imagination, all of it, you know. I'm, I'm a student of life and I will be, you know, till the end. But but in terms of like wanting to come back and go through this charade, this this um, this uh, circus, this dog and pony show that we call reality, hell no. Yeah, that. That's, that, that's probably an indication you're on your last incarnation, I would say. I think that's a common attitude among those who, if you don't really want to come back to this hell on earth, then that's probably your last time. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I haven't really personally experienced, I mean, I had a very serious illness. I, I You know, that illness, illness was caused by big pharma, blah, blah, blah. You know, I have every reason to be bitter, but, you know, mostly I don't I don't think in those terms, especially not anymore. Uh, you know, my my path over the last couple of decades has been, to actually be a lot happier and more fulfilled and to be grateful. And so I don't really see this as hell on earth. I see, I see a lot of hellish things going on, but this is really, the question here is what, what perspective are you in? Are you in the collective mindset where you might see this as hell on earth and a really scary experiment gone south? Or are you coming at it from an errant standpoint and you're busy, excitedly learning how to create your reality? Right. I would say I'm uh, errant from the errant point of view, but still I'm not, I'm, I'm not 
a solid several decades under my uh, shoulder. I've been kind of pretty asleep until recently with the uh, COVID crap going on, right? I know mm -hmm. you don't want to talk about that, but just in general, here in Canada on February 14th, there was uh, Trudeau suspended liberties and started freezing bank accounts, and that kind of started me. I was already investigating things, but I started with more of a sense of urgency, investigating more. So since then, I've really kind of got up to speed on a lot of things. So I'm like, a bit of both, more on the Aaron's track, but maybe in a, in a few short years, I may even get catch, caught up to you, but I'm probably more like, I see what's going on in the world, and it just so seems so evil, right? Mm -hmm. Why, why, why do people get together and do something? But right. it's tough to do. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly, I've been I've been doing the, the freedom fighting routine on that for a couple of years, and part of my, my recent awakening, it's like, you know, you think you're awake, and then you awaken. It's just this never-ending series of bubbles inside of, of bubbles, really. But my recent awakening has really been to step away from, from that drama and to understand that we are in certain situations that because of the nature of the simulation, we can't actually win certain debates. The two sides see things differently, and it's not that one side is right and one side is wrong. They're both right because they're being right. fed the evidence to support their conclusions. Right. Sort of like my analogy I gave where you can be talking about in my reality, my own sort of Truman Show matrix reality, I see tables as pink. And my approximation of my communication gets through to another person in their reality. They, their computer settings show tables as blue. And when I say, hey, our table's pink, they hear, hey, our table's blue. And then they say, of course, tables are blue. And it comes back out to me in my reality, of course, tables are pink. And we think we're agreeing on a special uncertain truth. And it works in reverse. We can be arguing over something, and yet we can both be right. That was the that was my favorite part of your article. I love that. It totally encapsulated where where I'm coming from right now. Just this realization that I it just finally dawned on me that you know you know not only are we not living in a Newtonian materialistic realm, we're not even really living in a quantum realm because within a quantum realm, there are still certain rules and things behave, and you can you know test some basic principles and that kind of thing. It's not totally programmed and, and simulationist what we're talking about is something that's just way off the reservation it's 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 a level of consciousness that's more shamanic it's 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 just deeply convoluted yeah it is and that's why you know my my interactions and what i think and what i say to people because because of this aspect of every my five senses is like the virtual reality hat helmet and my interactions are approximations reaching to other people's realities therefore there's no cross-contamination of anything i say or do into somebody else's mind or prime reality so that idea is very freeing to me I, I don't have to inhibit my right to free speech i can say whatever i want and however i want and it's not gonna like damage somebody else in any way really yeah i like that i like all that i mean you made so many good points in in, in your in your piece you know and it's very liberating i recommend that people go and and maybe read that article a couple of times. I, I did. I got a lot out of it. That was really brilliant. Uh, Dennis, the last thing I wanted to bring up is um, this idea that I had of a third path. Because there, I, I, there's another um, uh, thing that people might enjoy checking out. It's a recent interview that Jason gave to um, Joel Schaefer on the Perceiver channel on YouTube. And the interview was called, it was episode 58, Timelessness and Purpose with Jason Brashears of Archaics. And Joel is an expert in ancient Toltec style shamanism and different techniques that have been used for a very long time to journey in consciousness. And he had a beautiful conversation with Jason. If you let Jason, and I mean this lovingly but he'll bully you in a conversation because you know he's very very directed and he has extremely strong opinions and he has a very large energy field and that kind of thing and he's kind of young and joel is very yin but jason could not budge him they they were just dancing around each other the whole time and so joel really got to share equally in that conversation with jason it was a beautiful actually and he was basically saying that the archaics data that you're producing is very, very consistent with my understanding of Toltec shamanism and the nature of this realm. And, and not but, 
Joel also said that there is there are there are um, there are strategies that these people have used for a very long time to guess what to exit exactly. the simulation while it's okay. happening. All right, so there is there is some data starting to creep into my consciousness that yes, in fact, there may be you know back doors like in the Matrix, the Merovingian, and all that. They use these back doors to travel to different places that most people can't go. So right. there's at least the possibility that you have the collective scripted reality, and I use that in quotes. Then you have the errant uh, self-scripted experience of the simulation. And then you have the shaman or warrior's ability to actually come and go like Don Juan in the Castaneda book. Don, Don Juan, Don Hilario, they just come and go straight out of the simulation constantly. Right. I've heard of people saying they can, uh, you know, astral project, leave their body and go to other uh, planets and things. I think that's still way, sort of within the simulation. No, they literally disappear. Wow. They, they check out and then they reappear. So they'd be sort of like um, organic part of, part of life here, but they could do what Christ could do, walk through walls and appear and disappear. This is exactly what we're talking about, and you've said that a couple times in this interview, and I, I was just waiting to share this with you because it's very consistent with that piece of the Bible story. So maybe Christ was one of these shamanic ones that could do this. Why not? And maybe some of the things that are purported that he did were miraculous. Some of them may have been true then. Exactly. So or Manipulate or the matrix I mentally. He could have had real mi miracles. See, Jason is a kind of... Jason is kind of coming in at this from a scientific materialistic perspective, even though he's talking about simulation theory and he doesn't want to hear mysticism, but really right. we're talking about practical mysticism here. And this is what Joel, Joel Schaefer was, was explaining to Jason in their very beautiful chat. Right. And it sounds like the interesting really thing like, to Jason really and feel, Joel to his Sorry. credit. I felt like Jason heard him. You know, that was a, a very beautiful exchange. So it wasn't like he was rejecting. He was really listening and taking it in and responding. So really good interview. Cool. I mean, it sounds like this Joel is sort of like uh, John Lamb Lash, similar, similar thinking. Uh, no, I don't think so necessarily. Uh, Lash's stuff wouldn't be in the Toltec realm, and it wouldn't necessarily, uh, what Joel is talking about doesn't necessarily involve uh you know, plant spirit medicine, that kind of thing. There are other other things that you might do, and I don't know where Joel would fall on the whole goddess, uh, you know, Sof Gaia Sophia question. Really, don't know enough about his his um, his work to know for sure. I'm gonna, I'm planning on reaching out to see if he wants to have a chat on this channel. You know, and if he wants to come on, maybe we can explore some of those topics. Uh, I'd be interested in learning more. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I am more like Jason, left brained and uh, analytical and prove it kind of thing and but someone who can make pretty accurate predictions like jason is uh gets my attention i mean he doesn't he's not 100 percent right all the time but even in the bible it says in deuteronomy 1822 the test of a false prophet is they can't make predictions that come true all the time but when his come true like 89 percent of the time it still gets my attention well absolutely it's it's amazing and i've, I've explained so it to people and they're like awesome. you know when i when i shared this story with some people you know they're like man how do i learn that i want to use that for my betting or my stocks or whatever, you know, it's like, well, yeah, that's how you would definitely use it, but you have to know when to stop or you'll lose. That's the, that's the tricky thing in what Jason was doing. Right. I would like to create, I'm going to eventually create a, another on that page or my archaics page, uh, uh, a link to a message board type application where people can, I'll, I'll put up a video. This is what Jason predicts. Here's a PDF of his predictions. And then people can, around the world, po post on there what's happening in the world because and to, to help report to the degree which, what Jason's predicting is coming true. That might help aid in increasing awareness or, or negating what the scary uh, future Jason predicts. Perhaps not, but, you know, there's much I think I could learn in the process of trying. I'm going to add that to the page. Just thought I'd add that. His predictions oh. page to see which ones are coming true and which ones are not. Try to track it. Oh, I think that's a great idea. Let me know when you do that and I'll help share that information. I also wanted to ask you if you've ever thought about reaching out to Jason because he's he's so overwhelmed. 
with finishing with, with doing other things that he's not been able to finish the Opus project. And I, he, uh, I use yeah, no, pets. I haven't. I mean, you know, you're exactly the type of person with your background who might be able to help him get that over the finish line. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I do send him emails from time to time, and I don't uh, I don't often get a response back, probably 20% of the time. So he's either really busy or or just doesn't sense any positive energy, energy off me that he wants to converse with. I, I'm not sure. I think it's probably just he's overwhelmed. He gets so many emails. He spends hours a day just, just going through email. That would be, be impossible. I couldn't do it. There's no way I, I could be I could be spending that kind of time like that. So he's very devoted to to his uh, you know listeners and followers and more so than almost anyone I've ever seen frankly right I imagine he does he says he reads all his emails but obviously he doesn't have time to respond to all of them yeah I mean he doesn't respond to all of mine for that matter I mean we've had some exchanges but and I try to keep things pretty brief too because I know you know where he's coming from um listen this has been a blast um maybe we could do it again sometime absolutely email me anytime all right um listen you uh uh, you know, you we didn't get into uh, a lot of the the background work here. Could you just give people uh, just a just a synopsis of um, of your uh, your first published book? Um, let or, or not really a synopsis, but just you know, let people know uh, what is uh, relevant to maybe some of this discussion. It's the called the unveiling. Did I did I are we? We may be frozen. Did we break the internet? Oh, there, you're back, you're back now. Yes, I just wanted to give you a chance to to share something uh, relevant uh, from from your previous work. You know, I don't want people think thinking that you don't have other stuff out there because you have this one article, but you actually have a lot a lot more content. Yeah, I have a dedicated domain to my book. It's called The Unveiling, so it's uh, www.theunveilingbook. Dot com and you can read it right on there uh, in flip book format my first published book or you, there's various kindle versions epub versions you can get for free for download i only charge for an actual hard copy if people want a personalized signed hard, hard copy then i uh i'll mail it to them and it's like 20 bucks uh canadian or us 20 dollars us oh great great and and uh just give us like a teaser for for what that book is about What's well, sort of like the ET open contact scenario. The Pentagon in April 20, 2020 admitted there's something true to the uh, ET phenomena, aliens, who and what they are. And there's lots of speculation. And, and are they just deep state technology, holograms messing with us? Or are they actual aliens? And so my book is an open, open contact scenario where these highly evolved aliens help mankind from destroying ourselves on the brink of destruction on the opening chapter in a sort of... Uh, World War III type scenario, and they converse with humanity on an individual one-on-one -on -one scale, explaining the, the deep mysteries of origins of themselves and mankind and where we come from, where we're going, and they do a lot of benevolent miracles to try and help mankind, but uh, I, I, don't to, I don't want to give away too much plot lines, but um, like the fallen goddess scenario, I think La John Lamb Lash talks about the ETs, Archons, similarity in, in, in the, that, in that mm -hmm. regard, right. so I'll just hint at that that i i do add some drama and it's it's fictional story but i add a bunch of drama into that and there's some biblical uh quotes as well to add some credence to those who have more of a, a biblical background as to there's some s s truth to that jason talks about uh, 2046 crash of nemesis x and the return of the beans in that in that planet so my my book might be a, a little bit of a fictional take on what jason doesn't talk too much about but he talks about 2046 Nemesis X crashing to Earth, and there's some beings in that planet that, that come to Earth. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, I knew there was something there. I haven't read the book yet, so it's on my reading list, but I had this feeling there was some some direct relevance based on, I don't know, just my intuition, I guess. Yeah. Intuition, imagination, empathy, what Jason talks about is part of a divine inspiration. If we can tap into that, it's uh, important. I agree with that. Do you have any do you have any closing words or thoughts you would like to share with our audience? Um not really. I just appreciate your time having this interview with me and uh love to connect again sometime. I'll definitely update you when I get the uh page, the predictions page up and running with the message boards type app and uh anyway we can get the message out to our archaics information what he's 
what he's discovered because he's definitely onto somebody. It gets my attention when somebody can predict the future with pretty high accuracy rate. And that requires a look into these left brain prove it kind of mindset mm. that would help get people perhaps into a little bit more examination of the deeper things of life that someone can do that. And yet uh, there's still always will be mystery in life, which uh, is important to brace as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I will help you. I will help you get that out there. I think that's a really great project. Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to the next time. You bet. Thanks, Sol. Take care. You bet. Bye-bye.